Hello, I'm Ryan and welcome to my first vlog on skills versus capacities in the weight room. We'll look at the first case study, which will be a back squat, limited pie, poor ankle mobility, preventing full power expression. I'll discuss the technical model, explain how I got to this conclusion and I'll identify training moving forwards. Getting straight into the start position, I think they're in a good position with their head and their chest are up, with their scapula retracted, their elbows are tucked in to create tension and provide back support and their feet are slightly averted just outside shoulder width creating a good base of support. Moving on to the descent, we immediately see a limited ankle flexion and a fairly upright shin, which limits achieving maximal knee flexion and therefore maximal depth. As we see with the more mobile subject on the right, achieving a greater ankle flexion, so subsequently, subsequently a greater knee flexion. This is confirmed by more acute joint angles in the right image at both the ankle and the knee. Subsequently, in order to keep the centre of mass over the base of support, a greater anterior trunk lean is needed which puts more force and stress through the hip joint, but offloads forces at the knee. As we can see compared to the right image, less trunk lean is needed due to the greater knee anterior translation. Comfort et al. 2018 argue that when the knee joint doesn't go over the toes, this increases lumbar shear forces, and they recommend that athletes should keep an upright forward gaze to try and offload some of these forces at the hip joint. Observing from the frontal plane, I also noticed a slight mediolateral hip drop on his right side, which Kushner et al. argue shows poor pelvic stability and lower limb asymmetric strength. At the bottom he shows a good position as his head and chest are up, and he maintains a neutral spine throughout to protect his lower back from excessive forces. On the ascent his knees are continuously pushed out and maintain in line with his big toe to create a good base of support for power production. After observing his squat I delved further into his ankle mobility with a knee to wall test. He produced poor results showing 7.5 cm on his left and 8.5 cm on his right, as Godinho et al argues vertical jump is impaired by poor ankle mobility. Flanagan also argues that a poor pogo RSI infers the athlete is not prepped for an extensive plyometric training and has limited stretch shortening cycle ability in their ankles. So in conclusion, poor ankle mobility was shown, which prevents maximal knee flexion and anterior translation. This leads to greater anterior trunk lean, which leads to greater quadricep, hamstring and hip extensor contributions. As this person had a good movement pattern where hip posterior translation occurs alongside knee flexion, this was not a skill related issue. Moving forwards, we would improve ankle mobility and plyometric strength and look at hip strength and mobility to support the weak pelvic stabilization. A wider squat involving greater hip external rotation should also create more room for his hips to drop lower to improve his squatting depth. Onto the second case study, we'll look at a back squat with poor skill movement pattern and coordination, which limits expression of key power qualities and strength qualities. Considering the starting position, his head and chest are up and he has retracted scapula. However, his feet are pointing forwards and are too narrow, demonstrating a lack of practice and not providing a position for good power production. On the descent, he is shaky and his hips mostly move downwards with limited posterior translation, where the knee flexion is the dominant mover. Because of this, his hips are in line or close to the back of his base of support, when comparing this to the more textbook image on the right, where his hips are further back. Poor movement pattern causes the heel to lift to help anterior knee translation in order to keep the centre of mass over the base of support. However, Comfort et al. 2018 highlights that this creates dangerous torques at the ankle and knee and causes instability. From the frontal plane, the feet are facing forwards and there is a slight knee valgus on descent hindering the depth achieved. This is observed to be worse on the ascent, possibly due to poor coordination or to allow the hip abductors to assist with hip extension. Comparing this to the other image on the right, where the knees are outside the feet for better power production and for better stability. Considering the rest of the lift, at the bottom his head and chest are up, However, there is slight knee valgus and the weight is through the front to mid foot because of the heel lift, therefore not creating a good power production stance. On the ascent, there is a coordinated triple extension. After this, I coach the athlete and ask them to repeat one more set of squats. And as we can see, there is slightly better hip posterior translation, so his hips are slightly more behind his base of support. His knees are also slightly more pushed out compared to our first attempt on the right. Better coordination of triple flexion is observed, showing greater hip flexion at similar points of the descent. 
Less heel lift is also observed and less is needed as the centre of mass is, is more posterior. However, heel lift is still an issue because as the reps continue, heel lift is increased and the centre of mass is pushed more towards the mid to front foot. This may demonstrate that the athlete is stuck in a muscle attractor state where a non-optimal version of the squat has previously been practised. So in conclusion, poor movement pattern is shown, which causes heel lift and subsequently anterior knee translation. This increases forces at the ankle and knee and does not create an optimum power production position. Anthropometrics is not an issue as the athlete is 5'10 and does not have abnormally long lower limbs. The fact that the starting position and movement pattern improves with coaching demonstrates that this is a skill issue. Moving forward, we would practice squatting with a dowel behind the athlete to prompt hip posterior translation in coordination with knee flexion and also counterbalance squats to improve stabiliser muscles during squatting. And on to the third case study, which is a shoulder press limited by poor shoulder mobility and weak posterior muscles impacting power production. Considering the starting position, the head and chest are up and the elbows are at about 90 degrees with their palms facing away. So his forearm is vertical to instill force into the weight directly. However, his shoulders are not completely externally rotated and his forearms are slightly leaning forwards. This anterior lean of the forearm continues during the descent and demonstrates poor upper back strength and from the stabiliser muscles, which is then exaggerated at full elbow extension. If any heavier weights were used, then I doubt that this form could be maintained. See on the descent, there is shakiness, demonstrating a lack of strength and coordination. This time, the bench had been moved back one click to support shoulder external rotation, but anterior forearm lean was still an issue, as we can see. Also, the slightly arched lower back, which pushes the upper back posteriorly, would, would be needed to counteract the forward lean of the weights. I used a shoulder mobility test involving a dial behind the back, with the aim of having the hands close together. As we can see here, it demonstrates poor shoulder mobility. I also tested shoulder external rotation in isolation against the wall which shows poor external rotation as he can't get his wrist much past the level with his ears. There is also an arched back to put the upper spine in a vertical posterior angle to support the lack of shoulder external rotation. In conclusion, poor shoulder mobility and weak posterior deltoid trapezius and rhomboid strength is shown. Ultimately, the line of pull of the muscle is not exerting force directly into the weight and reducing his power ability to move weight upwards once the weights get heavier. Moving forward, we would look at shoulder mobility exercises as long as a mix of upper body push and pull exercises such as incline chest press, reverse flies or dumbbell row to improve shakiness, strength and upper limb coordination. Moving on to the final case study, which is a skill limited pistol squat who demonstrates poor balance and coordination preventing exercise completion. Standing on a single leg on a flat surface, he demonstrates shakiness instantly. However, on the descent, there is neither knee valgus nor virus, which demonstrates good stabiliser muscle strength. This subject does not get close to reaching exercise completion, as the thigh doesn't even reach parallel. However, the heel remains in contact with the floor at all times, demonstrating good ankle mobility and a solid base. With this in mind, I looked at easier balance exercises such as a single leg Y balance on a BOSU ball and as we can see he demonstrates really poor balance skills and requires him to plant his other foot. His poor balance is also shown through a double leg BOSU exercise involving external force around the body. This is a previous image of the athlete squatting showing good ankle, knee and hip mobility showing that this is not an issue and that balance and skill coordination is the problem. In conclusion, this skill limited pistol squat is demonstrated through poor balance and coordination and poor performance in simple balance exercises. Ankle, knee and hip mobility is not an issue and neither is strength due to the athlete's training history and his ability to perform a squat. Moving forward, we will practice single and double leg balance exercises on a BOSU ball and flat surfaces and Trikoki 2015 argues that skipping training will improve single leg balance and motor coordination. Ankle and calf strength exercises will also provide extra support. Please find presented the references used during this vlog. Thanks for watching.